Welcome to the American Planning Association podcast. This episode is part of our series on planning the autonomous future, which looks at the many ways in which autonomous technology will impact our cities and regions, mobility, and the planning profession. I'm your host, Jennifer Hennigan, Deputy Research Director and Manager of the Green Community Center at the American Planning Association. With me is my co-host, Kelly Coiner. I'm Kelly Coiner. I'm the CEO of Mobility E3, a new technology consulting firm that focuses on helping communities make sure that automated mobility makes them more accessible, healthier, and safer places to live. In this episode, we're talking about autonomous vehicles at the National Shared Mobility Summits. It's really been an exciting week. It's been amazing to be at the Shared Youth Mobility Center's summit, where they're focused on all the ways that autonomous vehicles highlight the challenges and the opportunities that we're really looking to in advancing advancing this this field that we all care about so passionately about the ways that people get to work to health care to educational opportunities just get around in life and you know we've gone to a lot of sessions um, this week and we can't possibly talk about all of them but let's take a minute to sort of highlight some of them and I, I think sort of the one that was really interesting was on the first day which was it really posed the question what can communities do now to plan for autonomous. Jennifer, you went. You want to take a minute to talk about it? Yeah, um, that workshop, it was great. It was a sold out workshop, which is nice to see, um, planning for the transition to shared autonomous vehicles. And that really looked at, uh, as you said, what we need to be doing to prepare our cities and people for this new sort of transit revolution. And we had some great facilitators there who made points on the changes that we need to see in administrative rules, regulations, street design, and there was a real emphasis on accessibility as well, what we need to do to make sure that these vehicles are accessible and also that the routes to and from the vehicles are able to be used by people of all ages and abilities. Uh, What was really exciting in this workshop to me were the breakout sessions. Tell me about those breakout sessions. What were those pictures? Um, The Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning had provided some scenarios for three different areas within the cities of Chicago, showing a primarily residential neighborhood, a retail district, and then what they called the people moving scenario, which was Michigan Avenue, actually right outside the APA headquarters here. And a point that they had made was that even if you had a dedicated bus lane installed on Michigan Avenue, which there currently is not today, that would not be adequate to serve the volume of buses and passengers that need to go through that route on a daily basis. So was the idea that if you had automated transit, they would be able to? Exactly. You'd be able to have more buses running more frequently and be able to handle that additional volume in a way that actually creates less congestion. That sounds awesome. It it was great. And then um, this morning, I attended another workshop on insurance and pricing models for shared mobility and autonomous vehicles. Who was at that workshop? There were all sorts of folks from different parts of the insurance industry. There was Maureen Brown from Munich Ray, uh, Eric Dempsey from Assurance, and Tom Troy from Allstate Commercial. And it was a really interesting discussion for me because in talking about autonomous vehicles, the concerns about insurance and liability always come up as something that people are worried about but really have no idea where things stand. So I thought the really interesting thing is it's like all the other topics we've looked at, AVs change everything. They're really transforming the way we think about insurance, but it's not just about the automation. It's also about the shared mobility and the peer-to-peer kinds of car services. Can you tell me a little bit about what you learned about the way insurance is changing to meet these needs? Yeah, that was really interesting because when you have these transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, those vehicles are driven by a person who has insurance on that car. But the moment they bring up their app to start servicing passengers, the commercial insurance from Uber or Lyft takes over. And that can happen 
you know, once a day, it can go on and off every few hours or every few minutes, depending on what that driver is doing. So the technology that's available to us in smartphones today allows these insurance products to become very tailored and get down to a granular level. If you were sitting at a transit agency or a city, what did you learn about what you need to do about insurance going forward? I would need to talk to my insurance provider to let them know what my plans are and what my concerns are because insurance companies recognize that they need to be a lot more flexible and be able to change to develop and deliver the sorts of products that address these new shared and autonomous uh, paradigms. Sounds like we ought to spend a whole episode on insurance. Yes, let's do that. I thought one of the cool things, I think we had the same shared quote, was that uh, was by... Uh, Tom Troy from Allstate. Right. What did he say? He said, this was the first time in three decades that he's ever seen standing room only in the insurance breakout session. That's awesome. That was pretty cool. (laughs) And then there was also the session on rural impacts. Right. So, you know... Over the last year and a half or so, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the communities that are not the big urban areas, that are not Chicago, that are not New York, that are not even my sort of home cities of Houston and Washington, D.C. Which is most of the country, really. Right. And um, one of the things that we talk a lot about in terms of equity is how do autonomous vehicles fit in a rural environment? What are the benefits that people get? And so... There's a session that Lisa Nissenson, who's been a great collaborator with us on planning with communities for AVs and shared mobility, um, did. And, and she really talks about a couple of things. One is making the shared use model fit for the community and meet those needs. And in the AV context, the biggest benefit right now is the benefits in terms of logistics. And those are high-speed types of trucking applications and rail applications. And not the things that we normally think about at a shared use mobility summit, but they're very important in terms of getting manufactured goods, high-valued electronics that are produced in rural areas and agricultural products to market. When it comes to shared use opportunities for people, the solutions need to be right-sized to that community. And one thing is that right now, Broadband coverage is really light in rural areas. That makes it very hard to use connected automated vehicles because they don't have anything to connect to. Right. But the this generation of shared autonomous vehicles doesn't rely as much on connectivity. They're smart vehicles. And so she likes to say, use your imagination and take your blinders off and think about what communities need to be served. So... Do we need to serve a community that's aging in place that isn't driving anymore? Do we need to provide service in a place that needs to get people around a campus, whether it's an educational campus or a healthcare campus? And those are all opportunities not only to provide real mobility services that people need, but it's also an opportunity to make our rural environments innovation centers just as much as a city is. And I love that Lisa was able to put that session together because it's so important when we're talking about mobility not being only accessible to all types of people, but in all places as well. It's a little wonder that the name of her company is Greater Places. (laughs) Right, right. So uh, the last AV Focus session uh, then was Jeff Tumlin's plenary session. Right. So Jeff's session... Um, really keys off of a book that's just been released by Dan Sperling um, on the three revolutions that we're looking at. And it's more than autonomous, and it's more than shared, but it's also active and electric. In fact, he calls it three revolutions, but I always like to say it's four plus revolutions. <laughs> yeah, it right? sounds like four. Um, And so Dan really challenges us to think about what are the policies that we need to be looking at to get all of these benefits and to create uh, the kinds of communities and the kind of world that we're looking for, one that's accessible, one that's safe, one that's clean, one that's equitable and provides services to everyone. What I like in the mix of this is that you have the big picture thinker um, in, with Dan, but also you have people who are really smart about how this actually 
works. Um, and so we heard from Uber about their experiences and their commitments to moving forward with AV. And we had a pretty rowdy conversation about um, what we learned from Uber going forward in terms of transparency uh, with respect to data and the management of the public right-of-way. Um, there also is another much larger mobility service provider uh, that's very engaged in the AV community. When we talk about AVs and shared mobility, a lot of times we start and stop with Waymo, Uber, and Lyft. What was really exciting about Jeff's panel is that Dick Alexander, who's a executive vice president at TransDev, was there to talk about where automated vehicles fit with transit. TransDev is the world's largest mobility service provider. And the themes that Dick talked about of the need to find ways to innovate within a really big structure but also to bring automation to scale, really exciting. Uh, Carla Bialo, who was really the godmother of the Columbus Smart City Challenge, who's now at the Center for Automotive Research at Michigan, brings a wonderful uh, perspective of where smart cities fits with uh, automotive design and automated systems as well. And then there was Krista Hutala Jenks from Finland. Krista added an international perspective to the conversation, focusing on um, the digital economy and mobility as a service um, from the public agency perspective from a national government. And I think that she really underscored the importance of how we rethink our public agencies from the national and the state level to meet these new um, paradigms, these new approaches to things. Um, there's a lot to learn from all of these folks, and I'm looking forward to not only talking to these individuals more, but also um, sharing some of their ideas with our listeners in coming episodes. And we were very fortunate to be able to get Jeff Tumlin to come in and talk to us for a few minutes. That's right. Um, Jeff has really been a leader in thinking about how automated vehicles can change everything for better or worse. Um, and he talked to us about the ways in which transit agencies really need to not just be at the table, but take the lead in shaping how AVs play out in the city so that we make our cities better for everyone. As Principal and Director of Strategy with Nelson Nygaard, Jeff Tomlin is an expert in helping communities move from discord to agreement about the future. For more than 20 years, Tomlin has led award-winning plans in cities from Seattle and Vancouver to Moscow and Abu Dhabi. He was recently the Interim Director of Transportation for the City of Oakland, which gives him a practical perspective on the challenges facing cities and transit agencies as they face automation and mobility. So Jeff, why are we talking about autonomous vehicles at a shared mobility summit? Autonomous vehicles are an accelerant. So there's not all that much that's radically different about them, except for the fact that they take some of our existing service models for mobility uh, and make them cheaper and faster. So the question for shared mobility is whether autonomous vehicles help us get to a better version of the city of the future or whether they accelerate the demise of mobility and equity and the environment and rational land use, whether they um, help bring us together as a society or uh, make society more divisive than it is today. Um, they're coming, they're coming quickly, and they're going to result in a lot of changes to the way mobility is delivered, thought about, funded, um, and how it impacts cities, equity, public health, um, and a whole variety of other topics. So there's certainly a vision of the future where autonomous vehicles are not shared. That's right. So in that vision, we all have our own individually owned Teslas or Google Pods or autonomous um, RVs. And as a result of that vision, public transit ridership collapses to nearly zero. 
Um, and the number of people that city streets can move declines significantly, resulting in severe traffic congestion and vast sprawl, particularly when not only do we re reduce the financial cost of individual mobility, we also reduce the time cost because in an autonomous vehicle, when we don't have to pay attention to the road, you know, we could watch internet cat videos or work or sleep or do who knows what else. So Jeff, one of the things you talked about was sort of how we how we provide mobility. So one of the things is what what are the kinds of things we need to think about in terms of shared mobility and autonomous that avoid this terrible future that you just painted? So the starting point needs to be a recognition that cities own the public right of way, right? All streets and highways are owned by government agencies. And it's a limited resource, and public agencies need to manage the public right-of-way for the public good. And that means, first of all, having to define the public good. This becomes particularly important as we turn the public right-of-way over to the private profit of corporations seeking to move people around to, you know, for corporate profit. So how can we allow innovation, and how can we allow uh, private entrepreneurship on our public rights away, but in a way that serves the public good. So we already had some of that experimentation with ride hailing services in particular, and some beginning looks at micro transit. What are what are we learning from that, and what do we need to sort of take from that as we move forward? So there's a lot of upside to Uber and Lyft um, and other ride hailing services as we suburbanize poverty. Ride hailing services allow people in low density areas to actually access rail stations in order to get to jobs in the city center. We are seeing an uh, increase in the quality of service that we can deliver to disabled people and to people who rely upon paratransit and non emergency medical transportation to get to their dialysis appointments, or at least the potential for that in places where effort has been applied to make that happen. But we're also seeing the beginnings of some potentially significant downsides. Because transportation network companies uh, can offer door to door mo mobility at a reasonable price, uh, at least so long as it's venture capital funded. Um, we're seeing a loss of bus ridership in urban areas, and the result of that is an increase in congestion and the ability of urban streets to move fewer people, even as big city economies are growing. Okay, I want to stop there. Yes. That's really hard to understand. <laughs> the ability of urban streets to move far fewer people. So, so let's talk about geometry. Okay. So... We're no longer bulldozing neighborhoods in order to widen highways. So our street rights of way are effectively fixed. So would it be fair to say that we don't have any place to put more streets? Or they're just not going to? Well, in developing areas, we'll continue to build streets. Okay. But in urban areas, we're not widening streets okay. or adding new streets or highways for the most part. There's a couple of exceptions. But for the most part, in cities, we have the streets today that we're going to have for the next 50 years. Nor do we necessarily want more pavement in our cities. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. So we have the streets that we're going to have, and those streets have fixed widths. So to a certain degree, we have a zero-sum game in cities. I am not a better person when I ride my bike or take the bus. But I do consume one-tenth of the public right-of-way while biking or taking transit than I do while driving in my own car. And that same, the same is true whether I'm driving my own car or I'm taking Uber or I'm in an autonomous vehicle, right? There's a fixed geometry to urban streets. Um, and in order for the economics of cities to continue to work, we need to prioritize the most space efficient forms of transportation. This means focusing on high capacity transit, walking and biking. Um, and it means we need to make sure that we help high capacity transit make the transition to autonomous operations as quickly as possible. And we need to make sure that we manage the street so that the highest capacity, most efficient modes get priority. 
because if we lose bus riders as they become autonomous Uber riders, the ability of the transportation system to move people declines. So how do we manage that right of way to make sure that high capacity transit is able to move? So the first thing we do is that in all urban places, we identify those top dozen bus lines that are carrying the bulk of the people. And this is true in every region. There's a small number of bus lines that are jammed full of people um, all day long. And on those lines, we need to make sure that those buses are never stopped by congestion and never stopped by traffic lights. Typically, the way cities manage their streets right now assumes that all vehicles are equal. What this means is that a person on board a 40 passenger bus is valued at 1 40th the value of somebody driving alone in a car. Almost all cities manage their signal system and uh, overall mobility program like this, assuming that vehicles are equal rather than people being equal. So one of the first things we need to do is look at our performance metrics. How are we managing the street? And to make sure that we're prioritizing people and goods as opposed to vehicles. This way, you can justify giving dedicated right-of-way to high-capacity bus lines and managing the signal system uh, to prioritize uh, person movement and person delay rather than vehicle movement and vehicle delay. It also means that in dedicated right-of-way, we already basically have the technology in order to do driverless buses in a dedicated right-of-way along a fixed route, we've got that technology pretty much today. And the great advantage with going driverless with buses is it means that you can operate the buses every two to three minutes, all day long, all night long, at effectively zero marginal cost. We can deliver really extraordinarily high quality transit if we allow public transit to transition quickly to driverless operations on the high capacity, high priority lines. So I wanna break that down. All the things you've just talked about are just really basic things about what makes high speed transit work for people. I wondered if you could help us understand why it is that automated transit allows us to have more frequent service, round the clock service, and have more buses moving through the same space. So the way transit economics works, transit operating costs are driven very much by the cost of the operator. So when you eliminate the operator, the operating costs are reduced significantly. And in addition to making transit more cost effective, the other amazing thing that happens is you can deliver very high frequencies at almost no marginal cost. Once you've bought the vehicles, if they're autonomous and electric, you can just run them all day long, every two to three minutes, 24 hours a day, provided you have enough time built in for recharging their batteries. This becomes extraordinary. So if using autonomous rubber tired buses allows anyone in a city to walk 10 minutes or less, go to the corner and always be able to see the next bus coming. That is transformative and amazingly convenient and can compete with the apparent convenience of door-to-door -door autonomous ride hailing services or personally owned autonomous vehicles. Um, it also means that cities can continue to grow. Because I can move 10 times as many people per hour in an autonomous bus lane than I can in an autonomous car lane. That gives me the opportunity to grow the city, to rethink how we design the right of way, and to take all of those parking lots that are as much of a th as a third of the land area in most cities and develop that into housing, into parks, into new jobs, into new opportunities for people. Autonomous transit can be utterly transformative to cities and allow us to have all of the benefits of individual autonomous vehicles without the nightmare sprawl and congestion scenario. Kelly and I were talking yesterday, but I, I, I continue to struggle about 
the issue of sprawl being caused by autonomous vehicles. Because if you could live an hour away from the city or two hours away from the city in this beautiful you know, rural setting, why would you not want to do that if an autonomous vehicle would allow that to happen? So that's a great fear of ours. The sprawl inducement that will come with individually owned autonomous vehicles is very scary. When you eliminate the time cost of driving, when you allow your drive trip to be productive because you can work or sleep or watch internet cat videos, why not live an hour away from work? Why not live four hours away from work when you can sleep on your way to and from work. Yeah, it's very scary indeed. So that is scary not only because of the sprawl, but also because of the congestion impacts. So autonomous high capacity transit doesn't solve the sprawl problem, but it does solve the urban congestion and quality of life problem. And it allows us to transform our cities into much more desirable places. So autonomous vehicles allow us to effectively eliminate all urban parking. Autonomous vehicles don't ever need to park. So all of that on-street parking, all of those parking lots and parking garages, those can become something else. All of that on-street parking can allow us to provide landscaped protected bikeways on every single urban and suburban street. We could make every city in America delightfully bikeable for an eight-year-old girl or an 80-year-old woman with two sacks of groceries. There's no reason we can't allow that transition to occur, but only if we plan for it now. So what's important to do now to plan for that transition? <laughs> well, the f there's a lot of things that we need to do now. So public transit agencies need to start leading on autonomous vehicle technology development and deployment today. If they wait, they are going to have their very existence put at risk um, as Uber and Lyft and Waymo start providing a cheaper and more direct and reliable alternative. And this means paying very close attention to labor. We have to bring labor into this conversation to make sure that we ensure a quality of work for public transit agencies. Uh, and that is possible now, given just the sheer turnover rate among operators. If we do the planning right now, we can make sure that there is not ever a single layoff, and we can make sure that pension funds remain stable. We can also do this in a way that doesn't necessarily shrink the labor force, but simply changes the qualities and characteristics of the jobs. I'm not saying that high-capacity transit shouldn't be staffed. I'm just saying it doesn't need somebody behind a steering wheel. Um, public transit can provide a very significant level of staffing uh, in order to uh, make sure that a high quality of service is provided. There's no reason why public transit couldn't look more like first class on an international airplane flight um, as opposed to the current experience that most of us have uh, on public buses getting to and from work. Well, I think that this idea of using transit to transform our cities into something better really does help address the potential for sprawl issues. Because if we're taking, taking back and reclaiming that land that's used for parking and using it for something that's going to be really fabulous and drawing people in and giving them new opportunities for entertainment and cultural experiences and recreation, those are reasons that you'd want to live closer to the city, even if you could live four hours out. There will be additional reasons for you to choose that urban environment that are going to impact your quality of life and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. What we're seeing both in mobility and in land use today is a flight towards quality. Um, and, and in particular, a flight towards sociability. Um, we are social primates. We love being with other people, provided the social contract is intact, uh, provided we feel safe and secure. Um, under those conditions, we travel great distances in order to go to places like Disneyland, just simply for the sheer pleasure of walking around in public. Um, 
the Third Street Promenade in downtown Santa Monica, one of the most walkable places in the world. People drive ridiculous distances from all over Los Angeles just for the sheer pleasure of walking around in a pleasant environment. There's no reason why all of our cities can't look like that. My fear is that on our current trajectory, we are heading much more towards the vision of the city of the future as pictured in the movie WALL-E, where ubiquitous door-to-door mobility results um, not only in a significant public health crisis, but also a breakdown in social communication. What can cities do now to avoid a WALL-E future? Cities need to get smart about parking. Right now, cities manage parking for the problems of 1965, not the problems of 2018. So rewriting zoning codes to eliminate minimum parking requirements and instead require maximums and unbundling is essential. Managing the curb in order to ensure adequate parking availability at all times, and in particular, manage the curb so that Uber, Lyft, and FedEx do not have to park in the bike lane or block traffic in order to pick up and drop off passengers. This is fundamental. Um, Another critical issue is that cities, because they own the right-of-way, cities need to partner with transit agencies in order to give public transit the priority that it needs in order to move more people more efficiently. Cities also need to collude with each other in order to make sure that they're getting good data from private operators in the public right-of-way. And most importantly, cities need to make sure that the current pending federal legislation doesn't preempt their ability to manage streets and that they work with their state governments to make sure that cities are given the tools that they need in order to manage streets to prioritize the movement of people and goods. And this particularly means looking at topics like decongestion pricing. Decongestion pricing. That sounds great. Um, Thanks, Jeff. This has been great. You've given us um, a lot to think about. So what it sounds like is that cities need to start by figuring out what's most important to them and then acting on it. Does that sound right? Cities need to clarify what their values are and measure those values and make sure that all of the mechanics of managing the street are in alignment with their local values. These are all good planning principles that we already know today. We just need to get serious about doing them. Something that's fascinating to me is that all of the things that we need to do in order to make autonomous vehicles not a nightmare, we should have been doing anyways for the last 30 years. Jeff, thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate your taking a few minutes from the Shared Mobility Summit. Thank you for your leadership on this complex topic. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the American Planning Association podcast. You can listen to past episodes at planning.org slash podcasts. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Have an idea for a podcast? Email them to podcast at planning.org.